Happy Memorial Day, and welcome to the Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast. My name's Nick. If you're looking for us on social media, go to Facebook and search Fan Counters. If you want to get in a private Facebook group where you can get some intimate discussion on the episodes and the guests, look up Sharpie Nation. Ask to join that group. We'll let you in, and we'd love to have you there. Today on the show, we're going to talk about some streaming content that's coming to your home on Tuesday. It's a movie called Celebrity Crush, and it's written by my guest, Oliver Robbins, who also stars in the movie based on his real-life experiences as well as some ones he made up. And we're going to talk about that movie today. Now, if you're wondering why Oliver Robbins sounds familiar, well, you definitely know him from the Poltergeist movies. He was in number one and number two. No one can forget the infamous clown scene where he's strangled by the clown, as well as when he's sucked into the tree that's outside his window. And we're going to hear all those stories about the making of the movie, the poltergeist curse, and more. But first, we're going to dive deep into the new movie coming out on Tuesday called Celebrity Crush. We want you to go out, rent it. I think you could rent it online or buy it. And we encourage you to do that on Tuesday. We're going to hear all about that. And this show with Oliver Robbins starts right now. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is Fan Counters with Nick and Elizabeth on the Podfix Network. There was this mob of people, and they're screaming my name. Crazy fans. Stop following me. Don't come around my house. If you do, the cops are going to be at yours. If I'm having dinner with my wife, don't sit down at my table. Don't follow me into the bathroom. Can I take a picture? We're gonna, oh, my God. I think this guy wants to fight me. Ended up being a fan. I'm the only one that's ever been on Sam Jackson and lived to tell about it. <laughs> well, guess what? I have a big surprise for you. That's why we call it Fan Counters. <laughs> I don't think you're going to last on the air very yeah. long. Hi there, it's Oliver Robbins. How are you? Good, Oliver. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us on Fan Counters this week. We appreciate it. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Now, these are some trying times for our country between the health of our neighbors and the trouble brewing with our economy. We are all staying safe at home, watching some really good digital entertainment, which has been keeping us going. What have you been doing to ride out your time at home? I've been watching a lot of movies like everyone else, and I've been also doing some writing and just thinking of all the things I want to do when this is all over. Um, I try to look at the positive side of everything. You know, honestly, I, there really isn't that much positivity to what's going on. Only the fact is that we can be a little more introspective. We can evaluate what we care about and what means something to us and what we're all going to do when we're out of this, you know, um, I think that's really the most what we can really take out of this entire situation um, and really be feel blessed when we do have our health and we do able to do the things we really want to do. Um, and I think this entire situation puts that all in the perspective of what we really value. Yeah. And, and I don't know if you're well, if you're like me, family has really been something that we missed out on. We kind of took it for granted that all of our you know close family was there. And now that we're distanced. It's like, I actually miss these people. <laughs> I want to see them again. <laughs> it really is true. I mean, I see that in my neighborhood, too. And basically, you really can't go anywhere other than your neighborhood. It's almost a flashback to another time. And, you know, I see teenagers with their parents, and they're like, you just know, a normal day of life, they would have never spent that much time with their parents. Right. So you see them walking around the neighborhood as a family. And, you know, some initially, I saw some of the teenage kids that I know in the neighborhood, they're like, you could see a little, they're a little standoffish with their parents. And then, you know, within the, like the third week, they're like, they almost look like they're looking forward to this walk around the block with their parents. Like it was, a, this is something simple and something to really look forward to. It's turning a bad situation into a positive one. And it started off real depressing here. And like you said, we're now looking forward to those times out with the family. So Exactly. Well, films like Onward and Trolls World Tour brought in some big numbers as they were released digitally. And on Tuesday, I'm hoping that you have a huge day with your film, Celebrity Crush, uh, is getting released for download. Now, I've already checked, yes. out, I've checked out the trailer. It looks very suspenseful and bloody, yet it does look playful, which I like. So as the, it, it is. as the director and star of Celebrity Crush, there's a lot of things that I could ask, but I want to start with the story. Tell us where the idea came from. What's the premise of Celebrity Crush? It's about this guy named Jonathan Blakely, who was in this film called Chain Face Clown that came out in 1985. And we're not talking a film like Poltergeist. You know, it was a B-level film of the day. Um, and lo and behold, 
you know, in 2020, this movie became a cult classic and young people really are drawn to it for whatever reason. So they're doing a re-release for it on Blu-ray. And uh, the guy I play, Jonathan Blakely, is at a signing. And, you know, he's a little down on his luck and he's feeling a little insecure about himself at this point in his life. And he's seduced by this beautiful but psychotic, you know, fan. And she kind of builds him up and pretends that she doesn't even know him from the from a hole in the wall. Doesn't even know about his movie. She likes him for him. And she seduces him and he wakes up at her house and he discovers that not only does she know about his film, but she's the super fan. And she has a tattoo of him of himself as a kid on her thigh. That's and creepy. she knows everything about the movie. And she's thinking they're going to spend their entire life together. They're going to fall in love. And when he doesn't really go with that plan, she goes to plan B. She traps him, tasers him, and he wakes up in her makeshift dungeon. And she proceeds to basically live out her fantasy of everything she dreamed about for the last, as long as she can possibly remember. And uh, he has to contend with everything that she does. And... Um, basically try to escape um and it's kind of a black comedy is a lot the things are horrific but they're also really kind of funny in some strange crazy kind of way so at times you don't know if you're supposed to laugh or you're supposed to scream now you filmed this movie in florida not la where you live why did you pick florida florida is just you know this is the honest truth i love la and i grew up in los angeles and if you have a lot of money um to make a movie la is fantastic However, when you're very low budget, and we had a limited budget on this movie, um, so we decided to go to Florida because they're kind and loving in terms of the people, and a, a $1 can really go a lot further than it ever could in Los Angeles. Um, like, you can get locations for very little relative to L.A., and, you know, and they're a little jaded, honestly, in L.A., because this is where the movie industry began and it was born. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go to Florida, it's... It's really they're open your arms up to you. they're happy to have you there and you don't have to be making, you know, a um, hundred million dollar film. You can make in a little movie and they, they're just they put as much love and support to your film as they would a big movie and really found that to be the case. And it was just a wonderful, great experience shooting in St. Petersburg. Um, and I would definitely go and shoot even a bigger film there right now. I know Kevin Smith just shot a film there, too. Um, and I was, you know, and I, I was, it's weird because I was going back to where I was born. I was born in Miami. Okay. So it was interesting to almost make full circle, um, and shoot a film in Florida again. Plus the location really worked well for what we were doing too. Um, so it, everything worked out perfectly to shoot it in Florida. There are some familiar tones in the film. You're playing a former child actor who's best known for a role that he played in his younger years, much like your real life. So did you write this based on some experiences that you had when you appeared at some horror film conventions? No, it was actually, I thought, what would, I've been to horror conventions, and usually I've had some of the greatest, most fun experiences that one could have at those kind of shows. I never had anything that happened to me like this. And I was thinking, what is the worst case scenario of what could take place? And I kind of just used my imagination. Um, and I came up with this idea. And um, I was originally going to have other actors playing it because um, I, I hadn't acted in almost 30 years. I, I moved behind the camera. I went to film school at USC. And I was talking to my film school buddies about it. And I said, yeah, I want to cast this actor or this actor. And they're like, no, Oliver, you need to be in this movie. It's, it's perfect for you. And I'm like, well, I haven't acted in 30 years. This is really going to be so nerve wracking. And they're like, you know, it's like, as they say, it's like riding a bike. Um, and so I said, OK, let's let's uh, let's do it. And I was working with my friend Michael Baumgarten. And I said, you know, we have a certain amount of money to start with. Um, can we make this film? And he says, no problem. And I said, let's go to Florida. We'll go shoot it there. And I will finally see the schedule based on what we have. And we have to shoot the film in almost under 10 days based wow. on our budget. That's and fast. I'm thinking. We're shooting. I know it was it was so crazy. I mean, I like you know, and he gave me a pep talk. And he's Oliver. You can do it. But I said I'm directing. I'm also acting in this, and we only have ten days. Not a problem. You can do it. So he was right, and we did it, and it was amazing. And later on, we got more money from these great guys, Tell and GB from Kaiba Films. They saw the original cut, and they're like thinking this is a really good movie. So we went back and we shot for a couple more days, and really polished things up. And I work with my friend, uh, Jeff Rubin, who also cut the film, who also cut my other movie, A Man Overboard. And we assembled it together and we worked on it and we made it what it is today. And I think it's, you know, it's a really fun, um, entertaining movie. You know, I'm fascinated when an actor and director can be the same person. And 
did you find it challenging to like direct and act in the same scenes? You know, were, did you have a good eye to know how your performance stacked up when you're doing it? I think it's extremely difficult. And, you know, honestly, I'm not sure if I would ever do it again. Um, I think if you can do it when you have more time and you have a bigger crew and you can really watch, you know, the dailies and also if just watching the cuts, we had no time to watch pretty much anything. So I set up the shots. I went by my shot list. Uh, fortunately, I had directed several other films before this. So mm -hmm. in terms of the directing part, I knew what to do. I knew what the coverage we needed to assemble the story. So I had all of that. However, like you're saying, I mean, it was extremely difficult to know the tone. Where are you in terms of performance? And at the same time, you have to guide the other actors with the performance, too. Um, I don't like to really leave character. So it was hard to direct actors when I'm in the care when I'm the character. So I have to turn it on and turn it off very quickly. When you're normally just acting in a film, you can stay in the character and you don't have to worry about being objective really about anything. So, you know, due to the time constraints and, you know, tone and, you know, and capturing the performance and also aligning up and directing other actors with their performance, it, it was extremely challenging. And it really, I really admire someone like Clint Eastwood, who, you know, it really makes it seem easy. You had to have had a really good crew on your side as well. How, how big was the crew for the film? Well, we, you know, we had, a, we had a small but really able crew. I think for a little low-budget film like this, you really don't want to have a monster crew because you really don't have the time. Mm -hmm. um, everyone has to be working twice as hard, and you have to know exactly what you want, and you only have so many hours to get so many shots. And everything that you shoot has to make it on the screen. Um, because that's critical because you have nothing that you're shooting that shouldn't be on the, on, on the lens and end right. up in the final cut. Celebrity Crush has already picked up some awards, including Best Horror Movie at the Melbourne Independent Film Festival. Did you get to go there and accept that award in person? No, I didn't, but my producers went there and they accepted it for me. Unfortunately, I had a conflict at the time and I couldn't go, but it just... I just, it's great to sh that people are actually loving the film that much. Because, um, you know, when you make a movie, you never know what people are going to think. Um, and I learned that really in film school. You might have one intent, but when people see your film, they could think things totally different. And, you know, it's interesting because things I thought that would get a laugh or didn't and vice versa. And things that I thought that were really scary, you know, when we were watching the movie uh, with an audience, they, they didn't really, weren't afraid by. But other things they really were. So, and that and that brings me to the point that you know you really want to when you when you make a film like this you really want to test it with audiences and see what they think and we did that um, after the initial screening of it at Dances with Film Film Festival and we said you know some things are really working let's work on this piece and move this scene around and and I and all my friends from film school from USC helped me out and we saw what was working and what wasn't um, and it you know in the end cut you know really does play for everyone it seems the film takes place because a celebrity had an encounter with a fan and on this show fan counters we like to hear about the stories where you might have had a real in-person encounter with a fan have you had those experiences that you'll never forget something that might have been weird or crazy i i have i mean you know for the most part i love going to the shows and talking about the history of poltergeist and my, you know my experiences and it's a lovely experience for the most part but i have had you know i had one crazy person who, you know, and I'm not joking, I think I was like in Mississippi or something. And not saying Mississippi isn't a great place. And I was only there for a couple of days. But this gal comes up to me and she says, you know, Oliver, I, I, I made you some honey. I'm like, what? You made honey? <laughs> she says, I have beehives and I have honey and I that's just what I do. And she, she gave me a couple of jars of honey. And I guess that was kind of a, by me accepting the honey, that was kind of a commitment on my part, you know, to a relationship with her. Ooh. And when I didn't respond to her, like on Facebook or, you know, other social media, she, she got very upset. She said, you know, Oliver, I, I gave you this honey and I don't understand why you're not talking to me. And I don't understand why we can't be friends. And it became really crazy. Like it really obsessive. Um, Cause just like, kind of like the character in my movie, she kind of painted um, something in her mind that we had a relationship, you know, and it all went back to the honey. <laughs> wow. What about when you were a kid being in two poltergeist films, you had to be a recognizable face as a, a young guy. So did you get any weird fan things happening then? I did actually. And it was, you know, it's funny. I was really, you know, introspective and inverted introverted kind of little kid. And it's strange. People say, you know, like, how did you act? And I said, acting was totally different. I never wanted to perform for anyone. 
I got to become someone else because when I was a little boy, I was beat up all the time and at school and, you know, bullying wasn't what it was today. Mm -hmm. They, uh, the principal said, you know, Alder, you really have to know and learn how to defend yourself. So I, I kind of used my acting as a way to defend myself, to be bigger than I really was because I was a little guy. <laughs> so when one day, you know, and my parents never told me this. They told me this years later, but it turned out my family was actually being stalked. And, no. they, and this is before the days of the Internet. Right. Um, so you really had to do a lot of research. So what happened was my mom said that someone was calling our house and saying, I know what you're doing. I know where you're going. I know what Oliver's wearing. And he really, I guess this person said what I was actually wearing. I mean, it was really like a scene out of a movie. Um, and when, lo and behold, only in LA, our neighbor happened to be an FBI agent. So, um, <laughs> we called in the FBI and they really helped out. And I don't know what happened, but that finally ended and that disappeared at uh, that whole situation. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it was, my parents didn't want to scare me, but I, we really did. I really had a real life stalker, I guess at the time in the early 1980s. Oof, that's scary. Yeah. As a filmmaker myself, I know the challenges of finding money to make a movie. And when the funding doesn't come through, you kind of have to decide if you want to scrap the project or just go out and make it. Luckily, you chose the latter with your film in 2012, 29,000 Wishes, One Regret. So tell us a little bit about what that movie's about. But I mainly want you to talk about what you did to bring that movie to life and the lessons it taught you to make Celebrity Crush even that much better. Well, this is I, I saw what was going on in the world, um, and it was, I found it very depressing. I made it during the height of the, the Great Recession. And people are losing their homes and they're losing pretty much everything. And I wanted to make a film about a theme about, you know, what do we value in life? What is the most important thing to a couple when you lose everything of material wealth? And, and what this story is really about, it's about the relationship. And when you strip everything down, can their love withstand a situation where they have no material wealth? And these are two people that were, you know, let's face it, they're really spoiled. They grew up in a world where they had every advantage. Mm -hmm. They went to college. They went, you know, they had great careers. You know, they spoiled themselves. Um, and they're in, a, they're in a situation where they could be that way. But when that's all gone, I wanted to question what is, what is their value of their relationship and what does that all mean to them? So I created a story about this young couple um, who loses everything in the wake of the recession, and they have $29,000 left in their credit cards. And the, the wife, the young wife, is you know, incredibly depressed, and she doesn't know what she's going to do with her life. And she says, you know, we, we're never going to come back from where we are. So let's use what we have on our credit cards. Let's spend what we have on the credit lines and just kill ourselves after we're done. And she's in this hopeless kind of depression, and he kind of goes along with it. And strangely enough, they begin having – the best time in their life than they've ever had before. But what they realize is the relationship is really shallow. It's one dimensional and they really can't, you know, be together for whatever reason, because it was never based on, you know, solid ground to begin with. <sighs> and, you know, a lot of things happen on this adventure they have. Um, and we shot that movie literally with uh, two or three people. Mostly it was just two people on a crew and the actors and um, I went out and bought uh, one of these great little digital cameras. I bought at the time they had the DSLRs, which uh -huh. are just, and you're probably familiar with them. They're like the little Canons, the 7D and the T2i. And you literally can just go out and shoot anywhere. Mm -hmm. You can totally do guerrilla filmmaking. So we went out and I said, you know, I went to film school. I know how to shoot. I'm not the greatest cinematographer, but I know how to light. I learned it at SC. Um, so I said, let's go shoot. So. I ended up uh, going out with these two actors and we shot on the weekends and whenever they're available, I said, Hey, uh, are you available this afternoon for like two hour window? Let's shoot this scene. So we did that over a period of maybe like two months. And because of the no crew and no budget, we were able to pretty much pull that off. We even went to Vegas and shot in Vegas with these little cameras, which was just, and people in Vegas, uh, just, they didn't know we were actually shooting a movie at the time. And they were just incredibly nice, you know, um, because basically it was, it was even a smaller crew than they even had at, like USC. But with the, wow. the technology of today, you can really do this kind of little movie. Um, and then I ended up cutting um, most of the film myself to um, on um, on a, my little Apple. Yeah. Uh, so you're really you're you're not limited today. It's just it's just your creativity and motivation. And I think we spent less than uh, two thousand dollars. I think most of that was gas and parking and just food and that kind of things. 
Wow. And so then when you made that film, it had to have obviously taught you some real, I mean, of course you went to film school, so you worked on a lot of student films, but this was something that you were creating from your head and you're doing it all by yourself. You must have had a lot of lessons that really pushed Celebrity Crush to the next level as far as how you knew uh, to expedite the filming process and, and different tips and tricks that you'd taught yourself. Yeah. I mean, mostly, I mean, and what I also, what I always really knew is you, you want to get your bare bones coverage, at least be able to tell your story, you know, have all your cutaways, all, you know, and you can't do anything really fancy. I mean, for instance, as a filmmaker, you know, you are at USC, like, you know, what does every shot mean to your storytelling? If someone, the rule of thumb is, is if someone should be able to turn down the sound on your movie and be able to know exactly what your movie is all about. And what that translates to is that every shot has to mean something. And, and if you have your shot list, you might have 25 great shots you want to do for the day. And you're talking to your assistant director and you're like, do you really have time to do that? Honestly, Oliver. And he's like, I mean, you're, you're going to get your 12 shots, maybe a couple more, but make sure those everyone's going to count. Um, and that's what I really learned from, you know, 28,000 wishes. When you're gorilla and you're under the gun and you're worried about being ticketed for, you know, honestly not having a permit sometimes, <laughs> right. you have to know that every one of those shots you're doing is going to mean something. You really have to think very quickly on your feet. Um, if you see something that works, go with that. And if not, quickly decide that's not working. You can't waste your time, you know, with a dolly shot. And I love dollies and I love those kind of movie shots, but you don't have three hours to level the dolly or light it and all the things you quickly have to make decisions um on what's really going to count to tell your story because you really and you can't as they say you have to make as they say make the day um because you're paying these people and you're not paying them a lot and they're mm -hmm. doing it because they want to be there with you and they're committed to the project but they're not getting a studio level salary right. you know so you have to be really cognizant of that I know that you have probably answered more poltergeist questions than you wish that you would have. <laughs> You're probably sick of some of the questions, but if you don't mind, I kind of have a few in my head that I want to ask you about. No, I don't, I don't mind at all. Okay. As a child, it's been rumored that you've lived in a haunted house in New York. So that kind of starts it out. So this was before poltergeist. You had already felt like you had some experiences that were supernatural or something. What made you believe your house in New York was haunted, and did your parents also believe it? Um, I believe to this day it was still haunted. I always believe in those kind of things. My dad was a Wall Street guy, a tough guy in Wall Street. He didn't believe in it at all. I think my mom was somewhere between me and my father, although she knew how nervous I was about all these things. So I don't know if she ever would have really admitted it to me. Um, we lived in this townhouse, and this is the backstory. Okay. We lived in this townhouse that was built right after the Civil War, and it, um, it was on the Upper East Side of New York City. And lo and behold, um, I didn't know this at the time, but it was actually a whorehouse. <laughs> um, and there was one room in this house. It was a red velvet room that I guess no one had changed. And, um, and this was in 1970. So this film, this book, not this, this place was over, a little over 100 years old at this point. The, the, my, my dad even admitted to this. No matter, even if it was the height of the summer, this room was cold. It was always cold, no matter what. And people got chills when they walked in there. So whether you believed in anything or not, you know, this room physically was cold. And I used to sit in my bedroom at, late at night, um, and I heard people walking up the stairs. Uh, literally, you know, you heard each of the steps, you know, each uh -huh. creak, you know. And I, I mentioned that to my mom, and she's like, no, it's just it's an old townhouse, and it's settling. Uh, but to me as a kid, and even to this day, it, sounded a lot, uh, it was not just settling. It actually sounded sound like footsteps to me. So, what, you know, I was terrified as a kid. I hated living there. And I was really glad when we finally actually moved. Um, but it turned out that was a great thing to have actually had happen. Because when I did Poltergeist, with their, their, all the things in that movie were all special effects. And we, I asked Toby Hooper, I was like, you know, Toby, you know, what are we screaming at? What are we terrified of here? And he said, we don't know. <laughs> but it's the scariest thing you could possibly think of. Uh, just imagine that in your head. And I always thought about this house, this townhouse in New York City, whenever I did any of those scenes in Poltergeist. I, I channeled that terror of sitting in those nights, just staring out into the darkness, thinking that someone is there or something. Wow. Well, that experience helped you then. So everything does happen for a reason. <laughs> it does. It, it's really, I, you don't know it at the time. Yeah. Um, I'd rather have not experienced the haunted house in New York City, <laughs> but it really did help with Poltergeist for sure. 
Well, because of the coronavirus, the South by Southwest Film Festival is being held online, so all the films are available to be streamed for free. And being a horror fan, I found the film called Cursed Films. It's a multi-part series that they're showing. And of course, the second half of the very first episode is devoted to Poltergeist. So I want to ask about two areas of that film that they explored. And this first question is one that you've been asked a lot of times, so I apologize for the redundancy on that. (laughs) But there's a scene where that clown attacks the character Robbie. I just want to know what memories you have filming that scene and if the robotic clown really did malfunction. Well, this is the thing about that. My understanding, it really did malfunction and almost strangled me. However, I don't even remember that happening. I guess maybe I put it out of my mind, but my mom said that, like, Steve actually rescued me. And, you know, and when I say it almost strangled me, I don't think it was like, you know, it wasn't a near-death experience. It was just a moment where it kind of wrapped around my neck and they pulled it off and it literally just took like seconds hmm. um, to do. But I guess, in, in yes, it did It did malfunction. And it wasn't really a malfunction. It wasn't like, you know, a roller coaster ride where, you know, this electromechanical device, you know, failed. It was just the, the like the fabric of, I think, of the arm got wrapped around my neck because everything at that, on the, on that movie was kind of electromechanicals before CGI. Mm-hmm. And it was, this was just a cloth, like, you know, arm that actually wrapped around me. Um, and that's, you know, and to be honest, dude, seeing that scene was actually really tedious. Um, we shot it pretty rapidly and it was everything on Poltergeist was basically like a new day of a new challenge they had for me. And for that scene, when, like, for instance, when the arm wraps around me, uh, there wasn't any CGI. It was all in camera effect. And what they did is they, they had a camera that went backwards or as an optical. I'm not sure how they did it actually. Um, but anyhow, I had to act backwards. So I had to start with the pinnacle of fear, pull the arm away from me. So then when you move the, you know, the film forward, it looked like the arm was wrapping around me and I was reacting to that. Wow. So, you know, it was actually a, a really tedious special effect. Um, and, you know, I never really put much thought into, you know, the, 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 the quote unquote strangulation of the arm around my neck at the time. <laughs> huh. Now, you were just 10 years old when you started filming Poltergeist. Were you ever scared by the content? I mean, I know you said you had to react to imaginary things, but... You're still dealing with a movie that has a topic that's really creepy. Were you ever scared at all you know, or have nightmares? Well, I think coming from my background from haunted houses and the real thing, nothing really creeped me out. I just saw it as going to camp. And I have to tell you, Toby and Frank Marshall and Steven, they made it such a fun set. And they made it like going to camp. And I think that's the thing when you work with child actors. You want to make it a game for them, make it really entertaining. Um, you were making, you, we know as grownups that we're making a movie and we're under these pressures and we've got to get it done in a certain amount of time. But when you're working with kids, make it a game for them, make it fun. And that's exactly what they did for me. So, hmm. you know, ironically, I wasn't even scared. I was having the best time of my life on that, on that set. And, you know, movies are shot completely out of order, and especially like a special effect film like that. They're all added in later on. Um, I was totally terrified of the film when I finally saw it. I was like, wow, this is really scary. I mean, I knew it was going to happen when we first saw the screen at MGM. And I actually had jumps. I, the jump scares, I was actually jumping oh my in the gosh. theater, too. And I, so, yeah, I, I was scared after I saw the movie. Um, and I didn't know exactly how any of the effects were going to work. And it actually really brought to my life, like, what is the magic of cinema? How do you make these things work? You, you know, there's so many elements coming together. And what it all does, it's kind of magical. I can see that if you'd be a 10 or 12 year old boy and then you're in this movie, but you don't see the effects, you go to the premiere and you're like, holy cow, I've got to do this forever. I could see how that, that would suck you in. It it really did. I was, I fell in love with the whole process after that. Um, Mr. Spielberg, I I showed him some early super eight films I did. And he said, you know what, if you want to make movies, um, I'm going to give you something. So we brought, uh, a Bolu 5008S camera to the set. And I showed it to me. He said, this is yours. This is yours to go make movies now. Wow. And this camera was amazing. It was like the top of the line, Super 8 camera. And this is, you have to understand, this is before there's video cameras, before we have the iPhone. If you wanted to make films, um, this is how you're going to do it. And he showed me lots of little tricks and techniques and things like that. And, and that's how it all started. And I actually... Um, ended up using that camera at USC on my first student films. And, you know, it had a great lens, this Anjou lens, and it was a zoom. And you could do anything you wanted. You were really not limited. You're only limited by your imagination with that camera. And that's an item you still have, I would assume. No, you know, really? this is the thing. And if it's out there, I know, this is what happened. 
I put all my stuff in storage right after college um, because I was moving into like a little apartment at the time. And lo and behold, there was like a break in. I get to the storage unit and the camera was stolen. And it had all the little notes from Mr. Spielberg. And it had actually this card, it's Steven Spielberg on it. So whoever stole the camera would have known that was Steven's gear. So if you have that camera and you're out there somewhere, no questions asked, uh, I want it back. No or kidding. send it to Amblin. It sent it to Steven, you know, because it's originally his camera. And if anything, it deserves to be like in a museum, too, one day, because it was Steven's gear. So it's somewhere probably out there um, in storage in some attic. And um, I think the world deserves to have it, you know, back in. I'd like to have it back myself. So anyhow, that's what happened with the camera I started filmmaking with. Wow. Now, the scene between you and Craig T. Nelson, where you're counting the moments between lightning and thunder, is one of those scenes that I never forget. In fact, I think I've taught my kids how to tell if a thunderstorm's moving away based on that scene. That's how iconic I feel like that one was. But another scene in the movie is where you're eating, eaten by the tree. And I was shocked to learn that it took two weeks for you to film that. So tell me a little bit about your experience filming the scene. Yeah, you know, every day on the set of Poltergeist, there was like a new kind of challenge. And I was a... I was kind of a rough and tumble kid and I, I used to have adventures with my friends in the neighborhood and fall out of trees. So I enjoyed doing anything crazy like that. And they said, okay, Oliver, this is what's going to happen. You know, the very first day we're shooting, they said, we're going to have these two arms of the tree. They're going to blast through this window. We're going to shoot sugar glass at you, which is kind of a fake um, kind of glass. However, if it hits you in the eye, it could potentially hurt, you know, badly. So the stunt coordinator who was amazing, uh, he, you know, uh, it was uh, Glenn Randall, and he was the stunt coordinator. He'd just come off Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, so he said, Oliver, this is what I want you to do. And he explained it very clearly, and I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. He said the arm, and Toby was like, the arms of the tree are going to come through, and you have to jump on the arms and pretend like you're trying to fight them off. But at the same time, in reality, we want you to attach yourself to them and let it pull you out of the window. I'm like, okay. So we had lots of effects like that. We had one tree for the arms. One where the tree is pretending to swallow or it's swallowing me. And there weren't really any special effects going on there. They said, well, we want you to do it, Oliver. Uh, we want you to act in the scene where um, you're pretending that the tree is swallowing you when, in fact, you're, you're trying to pull away from it. So, you know, they just had a little platform. So I was lowering myself and pretending like I was actually being eaten by the tree. And most of the effects were pretty much like that. There wasn't any, you know, CGI or anything. It was all electromechanical or it was just you doing your acting. Wow. That's cool. Uh, Poltergeist 2 brought Will Sampson to the screen. He's rumored to have believed that the Poltergeist 2 set was filled with evil, so he did a cleansing on the sets and props. Did you feel this to be true during your time on set? Well, I was just 14 this time, so if that was the case, they never mentioned <laughs> they didn't tell you. me. <laughs> However, you know, I, you know, Will Sampson was a very um, metaphysical and spiritual kind of guy. Um, I noticed that even when I was like 14, 15 years old. So if he was sensitive to that, you know, I, who am I to say that wasn't going on? Um, I had a great time on that set for the most part. You know, I loved, you know, working with Joe Beth and Heather and Craig. And I never sensed anything um, in terms of, you know, ghosts or phantoms on set or anything evil happening. I mean, the hardest thing was the fact that in reality, what was going on in that movie, which made it tough, is that the studio was – um, at a point where I guess they were running out of money. And uh, I think Kirk Accorian was an executive there at the time and already owned the studio. And they wanted to liquidate the studio to basically sell it and make condos there. So they were looking for any way to basically shut down the Poltergeist production and um, you know turn into a real estate development. So I think the producers, uh, Mark Richter and Michael Grace, were an incredible, and Freddie Fields were under an incredible, intense amount of pressure to make sure this film succeeded, that they stayed on budget, because I think the studio at the time was really looking for any reason to just shut it down and collect insurance on it. Uh -huh. So that was the real ghost on that set, I think, though, too. Well, people use the word curse all the time about the Poltergeist series, kind of as a way, I would guess, to explain away life and death. And people have probably used it as a way to cope with people who have left this earth too early or unexpectedly. Have you ever believed in any hyped Poltergeist curse? I, no, you know, I never really have. And I'd like to, even if I did, I'd like to believe it doesn't exist. You know, I, I think that every movie has crazy things that happen on it. 
Um, and, you know, honestly, most of the things that happen on Poltergeist are, are completely explainable. Um, for instance, you know, Jolene Beck, who played Kane, was you know, this wonderful actor and a great guy. He was dying of cancer long before he even started the production. And unfortunately, he knew he was going to die. Even the studio had to self-insure because they didn't know he was going to make it through the duration of the production. Um, you know, after the fact, people said, oh, well, he was, you know, he died after I mean, it had something to do with the movie. It really had nothing to do with the movie, and unfortunately, he had cancer. So, you know, people, I think, want to, you know, link all the dots and put them all together and say, you know, this happened and this happened, and without really, you know, looking at all the details of each specific situation and saying, you know, this movie was cursed. And, you know, and I think the whole curse in the urban legend is a good thing, and I'll tell you why. Because I think that this is going to give longevity to the movie. It gives it a history. It has an urban legend to it. Right. Um, and if that makes people watch this movie and it lasts another 50 to 75 years, then I think that's a great thing because, you know, that'll be part of cinematic history. Because um, a lot of films, you know, that air, which are great, will probably, you know, unfortunately won't be remembered in half a century from now. Poltergeist probably most likely will be because of all the fuel of the urban legend that has been going on with it. Yeah, I mean, we're almost 40 years past, and we're still talking about it, so, yeah. Right, there'll probably be another, eventually be another remake, I'm sure, down the line. Probably two, before you know it. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the remake of The Poltergeist 1. It was awful. <laughs> so uh, I did, I did. Did, did you? you? Okay. This is, what I, this is what I feel about that. I mean, as a movie maker and a filmmaker and having been in Hollywood for some time now, um, I have you know, compassion for any movie maker, because even to make a not so great movie, it is the most difficult process and you've got to go through hell to do it. And, you know, and we don't know, you know, really what was going on behind the scenes, having worked at the studio level before, there's a lot of people telling you what to do. And when the movie succeeds, they're going to be, you know, they're going to say they were behind it and they had all the vision. When the movie fails, they blame the filmmakers and the actors. You know, as they say, it's old saying, you know, success has many relatives and failure is an orphan, that sure. cliche. But, you know, I think it's really true. So we don't know, you know, what really happened on that movie because obviously it was a fail and it wasn't good. Um, but, you know, there's probably a lot of things happening behind the scenes that we have no idea that was taking place. Well, and part of it is, we just mentioned it, Poltergeist is this thing that's going to carry on hopefully for another 50 more years. When you remake a movie as iconic and classic and one of the best horror movies, movies of all time, I believe, I, like when they we did Friday the 13th, it's it's just not going to live up to that initial film. So, No, I think, I think you really, if you're going to do a remake at all, I mean, the way I would address it, you know, as a filmmaker... You really have to reinvent it. You know, don't try to do a shot by shot remake of it because films succeed not just because of great stories, but because they're worked for the period of time that they're in. It was Poltergeist was meaningful because of, you know, the late 70s and the early 80s. The film had power because of that, the relationship between the family, the kind of family they were and what the world in the, you know, the United States was really going through. So a film is meaningful because of the period it's also in, not just because of the movie. So if you're trying to reinvent this film and stick it into 2020, it's really not going to have the same you know, impact for Generation Z or Millennials. As a matter of fact, they might even find it cheesy or they might not relate to it at all. That's very good insight, yeah. Last year, Heather O'Rourke's sister Tammy came on Fan Counters, talked about the life and death of Heather O'Rourke. Can you share some of your memories working with Heather? And are there any moments that have stuck with you through all these years of memories you'll never forget? Well, you know, I remember just having a great relationship with her on the set of Poltergeist. And we used to ride bikes around all the time together. And um, you, and I think people have to understand, this is long before the Internet, before you had handheld video games, before kids could do a lot of different things and sit and play on their iPad. Right. There really wasn't that much to do. So we used to have like adventures, you know, riding our bikes around the lot at MGM. It was, it was very, you know, it was kind of poetic and magical and, and things like that. And we were, at our, we were sharing part of our childhood together, you know, at MGM. And we used to go to lunch together, all of us, my mom, you know, Heather's mom, Tammy. And we were all just like one big family. So it just wasn't, you know, just like one experience, I would say. It was just the whole collective moment in our lives. And that I got to share with her. Um, and it, I think, you know, if she'd lived, 
she would have gone to do a lot of different things. She was precocious and so smart and she had her own ideas and she even talked about becoming a filmmaker herself. So, you know, it's, it's a, we really, it's, it's such a tragedy because we lost someone that was beautiful and smart. And I think the world kind of missed out because we never got to see what she would have done. Yeah, I agree. Did you go to her funeral? I know you were young, but did your parents take you? I did. I did actually. I went to her funeral and it was just so sad, you know, and it's, it's, you know, even I was a young teenager at the time and, you know, it's a really wake up call to our mortality. I know. And, you know, life is fleeting and every, and it just reminded me again and again that, you know, life is meaningful and you should take every moment and enjoy it. And as cliche as that is, you know, it's really, really true. You know, there was no social media back then. There wasn't text messaging and that kind of thing. So it would not have been easy for you to stay, plus your age difference. It wouldn't have been easy for you to stay in touch, though. Was your last uh, moments with her on the set of Poltergeist 2, or had you done, oh, like, hung out after that? Do you remember the last time you saw her? She actually hung out at my house. She came to visit me at my house. And then I also saw her on the set of Happy Day. She invited me down, and... um. I I saw her on the set and I met Henry Winkler, who I actually went to school with his stepson years later. Oh, and he cool. was such a nice man. Um, and she was so sweet and she hadn't changed at all. And she was so even as becoming a, you know, a, a young teenager at that point. Um, she was, you know, she really had her head on her shoulders and she seemed very down to earth. And she hadn't changed at all since I, I worked with her on Poltergeist. And what did happen with Poltergeist 3? Were you ever offered a role to be in that film? I, I never was. I, so uh, I don't know what happened. I, as a filmmaker, I kind of think maybe it was because of budget. Because um, mm. I think the budget on that was actually very minimal. And, you know, believe it or not, I, I've never seen the film. And it's not because I, I don't want to see it. I just never been motivated, I guess. I just And I think maybe subconsciously or maybe consciously, I kind of want to let... The original Poltergeist, or the second one, um, just live in my mind is the only films of that of that story, um, you know. So that that's kind of my feeling about Poltergeist three. And you know, it's funny. I talked to a lot of fans of them. They're like, you know, it's awesome and it's great. And I met the director, and my understanding is he did a lot of amazing things in camera because they didn't have they didn't really have the budget to do CGI or any of the special effects. And having gone to film school, I really appreciate, you know, what he had to deal with because you're giving this film and meanwhile, you have two sequels that have millions of dollars and, and you're t- being told as the director, you can't do this. You have to figure out ways to make, you know, it's create the jump scares, create the story and, you know, and you're living in the shadow of, you know, a classic. So he, he, had, his, he had his work cut off for him. And he did a great job. I mean, the he shot with mirrors. How crazy. I mean, yeah. to not get any of the equipment or the people in the shots had to be impossible. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that was my understanding, too. And that was before they had a lot. It was easy to do, like, rotoscoping, uh, which is when you, you know, you can digitally map out, you know, the effects. They couldn't really do that at the same level they can do today. So, you know, he had, he had, a, he had a really big challenge to make that movie work. And clearly, you know, a lot of people love it. So he, he succeeded with what he was trying to do. I'm very still surprised, though, that you haven't seen the film, even out of curiosity. That's just shocking to me. <laughs> I know. Me. I, I know. I think I'm going to see it now. So people are like, ask me that same question. And I just, I just never seen it. Um, it wasn't, it, it was funny. I haven't seen it like, you know, this is the thing. If it's, your flippings are like Amazon Prime. And I'm like, a lot of people are just like, oh, it's free. I'll watch it. Um, I think if it was on there, I would definitely watch it. You know, so if Amazon is listening to this, they should they, they should, should put, pulter, put Poltergeist here on Amazon Prime, and I'll definitely check it out. Okay. Having starred in one of the most iconic horror films of all time and being someone who appreciates that genre, why do you think we like being scared? I think it takes us out of our real world. And let's face it, the movie re- the real world is right now a lot scarier than, uh, <laughs> than the movie reality, too. Um, you know, and it's funny. I, I, when I was in film school, I remember reading this, like, study i guess and they said when you're watching a movie you're in the same state of as a dream world you're like your mind is on a dreamscape mm-hmm. level and i think we want to be going to that dream world i think we want to live in that alternate reality um and we want to be scared you know we don't want to be scared in real life with have someone like jason stalking us but to watch that moment on in cinema is powerful and it allows us to experience something that's a thrill it's like taking a roller coaster ride or a ride and that's really fun. And I, I enjoy that. 
you know, and it allows you to experience something that you normally would never want to experience in daily life. All right. What are some of your favorite horror or scary movies? I would say The Exorcist, um, Rosemary's Baby. Um, those movies are just terrifying. I, I think The Exorcist is so real mm-hmm. and raw. And I love films that really they have you know rich characters that um, that and it's also a slow burn. You get to know the characters. There's really not a lot going on in Exorcist for the first like 30 minutes, and they really ground it in reality. And then you get to know the and there really isn't you know a simple answer to like why is the possession going on? Why is this taking place? I like films that are complicated like that, that don't serve up all the answers, you know. Um, I think those are too simple. And I think audiences really, you know, are, think those are dumb for the most part. And Exorcist really doesn't do that. And it's terrifying. And like we were talking about, <clears throat> a lot of those effects are all in camera or they're flash cuts. It's due to the editing. Right. And I think the problem with a lot of films today with a lot of the horror films there's too much, way too much CGI. And let's face it, a lot of those effects are not where they're ever going to be, at least in our lifetime, where we're gonna, they're going to look completely real, um, maybe in 50 to 100 years from now. Maybe it will happen sooner. But even that, I think people start to use that as a crutch, as a filmmaker, when you show everything. The reason why Poltergeist is great, you know, is that you really don't see that much. And the same thing with Exorcist. It's what you don't see, and you're feeling the characters and everything that they're experiencing. Because, you know, your imagination is going to be far greater than any special effect you could possibly do. And the same thing with, you know, the if Alien or Aliens. Mm-hmm. Um, Cameron did such an amazing job because you don't see the monster right. very much in that movie. You have flash clips of it. And that's all you really need because that's what's terrifying about it. Um, so, yeah. And in Rosemary's Baby, I love that film because it's just – the slow build of these characters and this relationship, and you know, it, you really never really see that kind of storytelling today. I could watch those kind of movies again and again and never really get bored. I agree. There, especially some of those classics, they stick with you. You have brief memories of them, and then you rewatch them, and you're still scared all over again, and you know it's coming. <laughs> so that's when you know it's a good movie. Yeah, and, you, yeah, and the performances, and the, I think the key with all of these movies, the performances are so strong and that's what you really need. I mean, end of the day, you know, um, Mr. Stroberg taught me a value lesson. And he said, you know, he said, Oliver, he said, Oliver, compassion will always win over camera. And what he's really saying is that, meaning you have a scene between actors and a meaningful scene between them is going to be far more powerful than any special effects you could possibly have. Because if you watch Jaws, you know, you know, as we all know, the, the shark failed, you know, during you know, the, the making of it. And they had to find ways around that. The editor did that. And what, why that film has holding staying power today is those relations between all those characters. I mean, Richard Dreyfuss is so amazing. And those guys, when they're out on the boat, and the terror that they're in, and, you know, that dichotomy. Um, and there are, there's no special effects to that other than the performances. And that's what makes Jaws such a great movie. And also, you know, the scenes in all of Spielberg's movies, even the scariest of films, there's so much heart. I mean, how many horror movies do you have scenes like in Jaws um, where the, the filmmaker is daring enough to put a scene where, you mean, in Red Schreider says to the little boy, his son, he says, you know, give me a kiss. And he says, why? And he says, because I need it. And those are compassionate, lovely little scenes that you don't really ever see today in horror movies. It's all about the jump scare. Yeah. But you need those, those kind of moments to really bridge all the horror so you care about the characters and you're rooting for them. During quarantine, one of the hidden gems that I found on Stars as I was going through some movies that I hadn't seen, I picked one out called Brightburn. Have you seen this film? No, I've never seen it. All right. I definitely recommend you check it out because it is, you know how like horror movies just aren't the same anymore because you're right. They're all about the jump scares. This kind of went back to that hiding the monster in the closet as long as possible type situation. And it was one where I was, it was like an hour and a half and it was a quick hour and a half. It was uh, an excellent horror film. Wow. What's it about? So it's about this boy, and you find out kind of early on that this couple tried to have a baby. They couldn't have a baby, so they ended up finding this child in the woods. And instead of telling anybody it wasn't their kid, they just brought it in and raised it. But by the time it's 10 years old, weird things start happening, and you find out the history of this baby. Oh, that sounds good. It sounds like a slow burn. It's almost like Superman. But the reverse is Superman. Instead of having like great superpowers, you you learn this kid is in all that he you think he is. He's more. So what's it called? Brightburn. Okay, I'll definitely check it yeah, out. Yeah, definitely. I, I recommend it. 
Now, Oliver, you're on Cameo, I found out. So I'm kind of wondering if you've had any weird requests on Cameo. I, you know, believe it or not, I haven't had that many Cameo requests. Okay. And they've all just been like birthdays or things like that. So yeah, nothing, <laughs> nothing too crazy yet. So oh. yeah. Um, um, so yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I, I, there isn't anything, to, I haven't had any crazy requests, but I'm looking forward to getting them if I ever get them on Cameo. All right, let's send them in and then you come back and tell us about them. <laughs> <laughs> now look, I've I got. I'll do a follow up. That'd be great. Uh, I see on your IMDb, which we know is not always accurate, but hopefully some most of it is, uh, you've got a new movie coming out that you're in called The Rideshare Killer. Looks like something coming out next year. Is that right? Yes. I work with this filmmaker, Ashley Myers, and he is a great filmmaker. I actually worked with him before as a director. I directed a film he co-wrote called Man Overboard. And he saw me in Celebrity Crush. He was like, you know, Oliver, I'm making this movie, this uh, and this thriller. Do you want to be in it? And I said, do I have to audition? He said, nope, you don't even have to audition. I know you're great and you can be in it. So I said, okay, why not? And it's, this little, it's a neat little part. I play this crazy guy. Um, it's actually kind of like the polar opposite of my character in Celebrity Crush where I'm kind of this, this potential stalker. I won't tell you any more about the story, but I got to act with Eric Roberts in the scene. And Eric Roberts was like my hero. He was such a fine, great actor. And I said, yeah, and he, he told me, he said, yeah, they, Eric Roberts plays a detective and you get to be in a scene with him, Oliver. And I was like, wow, that's, I have to cross that off my, you know, my bucket list as, a, as an actor. Um, and I, he was just so great and so professional. And, and, you know, and this is a, you know, large, low budget movie. Wow. So we had to move really quickly and just shoot these scenes out fast. And, um, and we did it. And I, I had such a blast working on, on Rideshare Killer. And it was fun not to be directing again, uh, honestly, because it, it's acting is fun when you don't have to worry about calling action. <laughs> right. <laughs> and what everybody else is doing. Yeah. And you can focus on, on your acting and, and that's it. And that's such a, and that really was a joy. All right, so we mentioned at the top of the show that Celebrity Crush is coming out on Tuesday for release for download. Where's the best place that you want to send people to get the, get the film? Um, you know, I think they can check out, you know, I'm updating Facebook. So check out Celebrity Crush on Facebook because I'm making a lot of posts on that. Um, and I'll update everyone on Facebook about it. Um, and you can also go to our website, celebcrushmovie.com. Um, and that's the trailers there. Or you can just Google Celebrity Crush. Um, and it should definitely come up and you can watch them on YouTube and the trailer. And I think it should be on most of the digital platforms. I don't know exactly where yet, um, but I, I believe it will be in most places. Very cool. Well, Oliver Robbins, thanks for being here. We really do appreciate your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. My thanks to Oliver Robbins for joining me on the show this week. I have to tell you, Poltergeist is one of my favorite horror series of all times. And what I really loved about Oliver is that he has... His style was, you know, no holds bar. You could ask him anything and he answered it. And I really appreciate when guests come on and will answer any curiosity that I have. And that was no exception today. Hope you enjoyed it. To support Oliver, you can get his film Celebrity Crush on Tuesday. You can buy it or stream it on any platform. Look for Celebrity Crush on Facebook as well for more detailed information on where that film is going to be available. And we hope you check it out. Keep in touch with us on Facebook. You can join our private group, Sharpie Nation, or join 29,000 of our fans on the Fan Counters group, which you can find by just typing in Fan Counters on Facebook. To contact me directly, just email me, hello at fancounters.com. I've got another celebrity guest coming up next week from a hit television series on CBS. If you want to find out who that guest is going to be ahead of time, Go ahead and join Sharpie Nation, and as of today, I'll post who that guest is. Otherwise, you'll have to wait till next Friday to find out. So in the meantime, have a great Memorial Day weekend. We hope you have a fun time with family and friends, and stay safe and healthy. And we'll see you back here next week on the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast. Bye-bye.